All right, thanks very much for coming out. Um, I need to say thanks to the uh, Franklin Humanities Institute and the directorship of Randy Connor for helping us to generate a consciousness about uh, the long histories of climate crisis and its social economic context. Thanks, as I, I was saying, to the Franklin Humanities Institute and also the Nicholas Institute for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability, as well as the Nicholas School of Environment for helping us to put this event on, sponsoring this event. Um, I was thinking that, you know, these songs, I'll just read what I wrote, sort of bear, bear witness to the lost displacement, expulsion, and dispossession that internal migrants experienced. According to one BBC podcast on arts and ideas, by some estimates, the carbon lost in the Dust Bowl in the US in the 20s and the 30s <clears throat> is greater than all the cars ever to have driven. And that's quite incredible, isn't it? Showing the real carrying capacity of the soil there potentially when it comes to carbon. And of course, those soils that have been built by the movement of large herbivores over many thousands of years. So that's kind of speaks to the role of sort of roaming big ruminant livestock in maintaining um, a soil uh, productivity. According to Stephen Leahy, more than 75% of the Earth's land areas are substantially degraded, undermining the well being of 3.2 billion people. And according to the world's first comprehensive evidence based assessment, these lands are said to have become desert desertified and polluted or deforested. Some have been converted to agricultural production, resulting in species extinctions. In fact, scientists disavow the use of the notion of desertification, preferring instead the concept of deforestation because deserts, as they say, are not really dead lands, but places crawling with different species and biodiversity of one kind or another. It's simply another different kind of landscape. And I know that uh, Holly, Professor Hallman makes reference to this in her text, uh, Dust Bowls of Empire. If this soil loss trend continues, it's a report 95% of the Earth's land areas could become degraded by 2050. That would potentially force hundreds of millions of people to migrate as food production collapses in many places. According to Robert Watson, chair of the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services launch in Medellin, Colombia, Land degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change are three different faces of the same central challenge. The increasingly dangerous impact of our choices on the health of our natural environment. For example, losing soil results in releasing the carbon once lodged in the soil into the atmosphere, thereby contributing to global warming. Such degradation has been accounted for by high population, quote unquote, in a sort of Malthusian kind of way, overuse for agricultural production and affects health incurring malnutrition from reduced food and water supplies, more water and foodborne diseases that result from poor hygiene and a lack of clean water and respiratory diseases caused by atmospheric dust from wind erosion and other air pollutants the spread of infectious diseases as populations migrate. On, the, on this same arts and ideas program that I listen to regularly on BBC, they were extolling the virtues of city chickens. Now, city chickens I came across when I was a graduate student at Binghamton University, which were fried chicken thighs. Um, Thighs, no legs, sold on a stick like a lollipop, and it was called city chicken. So <laughs> I was listening about this fix for this pattern of soil loss and soil degradation in South England. The narrator said, We know cows, cows' burps are a problem for climate change, but their dung also helps put carbon back into the soil. So this 
mobile dairy in the south of England may prove part of a solution. Cows are put onto this truck, I guess, and spread across, carried across, transported across land where they can, um, they use to spread their dung. And that's part of the solution. If you spread the dung across the fields and not leave it in the farm lots, lots as happens, especially in the US, in that way, nutrients and carbon from the pasture returns to the soil. That's one fix. They said, we realized that we need to put grass back into the system and to manage the grass we brought in, we brought in dairy cows. The evidence was provided by two fields, one with light stony soil depleted from crops grown with chemical fertilizers, and the other a dark carbon rich soil in the field previously fertilized by cows. Will this work for CAFOs, an operation defined as a concentrated animal feeding operation, if it meets the definition of an animal feeding operation and confines more than a thousand animal units, and these 1,000 animal units is equal to 2,500 swine, 100,000 bro um, broilers, 700 dairy cows, or 1,000 beef steers. I sort of tried to imagine how <laughs> this dairy mobile for, um, system would work for such large concentrations of, of cattle. But there are other stories that are hidden from the account statistics and the fixes like mobile dairies proposed here, carbon trades, green deals in general, all of which lead, leave the system of growth without or few constraints intact and their Washington lobbyists and those elsewhere operating business as usual. Underpinning our project here at the FHI is the idea of thinking climate crisis through a long durée that encompasses and is punctuated by projects of global raciality, colonialism, and therefore advocates decolonization as the only certainly the principal ethical response to the transfiguration of the politics of growth and majority exclusion. Place matters to be sure, but our locals are fundamentally incorporated within these geographies of accumulation, geographies of management, and geographies of imagination accompanied by their suspect North Atlantic universals, as Mich Michel Rautuyo would say. Our presentation today, No Empires, No Wastelands, the necessity of forging a real ecological solidarity for the 21st century, would make a compelling case for such a long durée perspective as a critical investigative method to think the current planetary conjuncture. We are privileged to be hosting Professor Hannah Holman, Associate Professor of Sociology at Amherst College, whom I met a decade ago at a rural sociological conference <laughs> somewhere in the U US, California, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Holman wrote the superb text, Dust Bowls of Empire, Imperialism, Environmental Politics, and the Injustice of Green Capitalism, which unsilences the long history, dispossession, and displacement leading up to the catastrophic devastations occasioned by the dust storms of the 1930s. Hers is a history of making and consolidation of the US empire. Professor Holman is one of the directors of Monthly Review Foundation. She serves as a member of the editorial board for the Journal of World Systems Research and recently joined the editorial board for the Journal of Peasant Studies. She also currently serves an, as an exhibit scholar advisor at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. We're honored to have you here with us. Hannah, please join me in welcoming Professor Holman. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you all for having me. I really appreciate all the behind the scenes work that goes into putting something like this on. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. It also always means a lot to me to visit North Carolina. People here in the state have really been at the front lines for a long time of the interconnected anti-colonial abolitionist immigrants rights and labor struggles here in North America. And obviously also the organizing against environmental racism has informed the development of the environmental justice movement, not just in the United States, but around the world. And today I think that North Carolina is one of the states that we can really say is on the front lines 
of the climate justice struggle as well. So it's something we can talk about a little bit later. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and especially to engage with you in person after so many Zoom meetings, it's nice. And I'm excited to learn more about your work and how it relates to these struggles in the state and beyond. So very much looking forward to discussion. Now, to get started, along with acknowledging the folks who made this event possible, I also want to acknowledge that we're making use as we meet today of materials that are only available to us as a result of the extraction, commodification, and reassemblage of the metals and minerals used, for example, to manufacture our computers, and of trees from forests to make our furniture and the paper products that we use. The unsustainable exploitation of soils, which Michaeline just described, provides for our food and some of the fibers that we're wearing. And the extraction of fossil fuel deposits around the world provides for the petroleum products or plastic that's in almost everything else around us. So we are, as we sit today, always surrounded by nature that's come to us from somewhere where somebody else lives, works, plays, and prays. A core concern of scholars in the environmental social sciences is just how much our everyday lives in wealthy countries and in the wealthiest enclaves everywhere imply that much of the world be treated as wasteland, places from which we extract, and places that are forced to absorb the effluence of the affluent. And how the rules, culture, and ideology governing the modern capitalist economy helps naturalize for too many the idea and the practice of routinely treating some people and places and even entire species as disposable. So as a consequence of this today, we're living in an era defined by egregious levels of inhumanity and profound anthropogenic shifts taking place in the earth's life support systems, our land, climate, and water systems. Contemporary ecological crises are associated with high levels of racialized social inequality, imperial expropriation, social dislocation, and the resurgence of nationalist and even fascistic politics. In the face of these intersecting crises, many are looking back at history to make sense of how we got here, where we're going, and what kinds of change are possible and necessary. And this is of course why we're having a backlash right now and, and new struggles over what kind of history gets told, whose history gets told, and so on. This is something that we could also talk about later. It's in this context of intersecting crises that the Dust Bowl, Depression, and the New Deal have become major reference of the climate change era, not just in the United States, but in many countries around the world. So today there's a serious revival of popular and scholarly interest in the Dust Bowl because Dust Bowl conditions, as Michaeline described, are returning in many parts of the world, including the originally named Dust Bowl region. And you said you lived in Lubbock, you might have seen some of this. <laughs> so when things are only going to get worse in arid and semi-arid places as climate change progresses, this is because one of the most consequential um, impacts of climate change is how it's driving shifts in the global hydrological cycle or water cycle with profound consequences for society. So essentially we're seeing wet places get wetter and dry places get much drier. And we already see the effects of this around the globe in changing hurricane and wet season patterns, as well as in longer and more severe droughts, um, including here in the United States. So scientists have warned that the drought conditions of the 1930s Dust Bowl are on track to become the new permanent climatology in the US Southwest and significant portions of Mexico, as well as in other regions around the world. So it's this possibility of what one group of scientists at Columbia termed perpetual drought, combined with growing concern about widespread land degradation and soil erosion that have raised again the terrible specter of the Dust Bowl for many scientists and commentators. In the United States, despite the widely acknowledged tragedy of the Dust Bowl and the lessons we supposedly learned, we're on track to repeat the soil losses of that era on an even greater scale. So all of this has led to increased interest across disciplines in the lessons that we may draw from the Dust Bowl period to inform adaptation and mitigation of these socio-ecological crises. 
So we also, this has also led to increased reporting in the popular press on the development of Dust Bowl-like conditions, both in the United States and around the world. So if you, once you start thinking about the Dust Bowl, you see it everywhere. <laughs> um, but you're really starting to see um, this kind of language and description being used to describe places as di you know, divergent as Iran, Syria, and then of course um, here in the United States. So references to the Dust Bowl like these are meant to indicate the severity and extraordinary nature of current and expected crises, given that the Dust Bowl is considered by many one of the most extreme man-made ecological and social disasters in US history. And at the same time, they point to the fact that dust bowlification is understood as an increasingly likely and ordinary threat in the face of climate change for many regions around the world. I'm getting over a little cough, so I might take a few sips of water here. So before going any further, I thought I would just step back for a moment and talk about what the Dust Bowl is in case some of you are unfamiliar. I realize that when I've asked people what they what the Dust Bowl means to them, it can mean a lot of different things. So I just thought I would tell you. Um, so what do most people mean when they refer to the Dust Bowl? And so the Dust Bowl is actually a term that was coined by a journalist in 1935 and is used variously to refer to an historical period, a geographical region, and an ecological and social disaster. So geographically, the Dust Bowl tends to refer to the region at the heart of the crisis of soil erosion and drought in the 1930s, including considerable portions of Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado. So some extend their analyses throughout the entire Midwest up into Canada, um, but this is really the area that was hit the hardest. So officially, the United States Department of Agriculture describes the Dust Bowl as the period of drought from 1931 to 1939 that was coupled with severe wind-driven soil erosion of overgrazed rangeland and soil exposed by the use of farming practices not adapted to the semi-arid U.S. Great Plains. The eroding soil from once productive range and croplands filled the air with billowing clouds of dust that subsequently buried farm equipment, buildings, and even barbed wire fences making living conditions for many on the Great Plains, uh, living conditions for many of the Great Plains inhabitants unbearable. So there have been many government publications since the 1930s that highlight specific problems related to the Dust Bowl. And since then, like I said, there's been a large and growing body of scholarly literature where there are debates over particulars of what happened. But most scientists and scholars who write about the Dust Bowl, even if they disagree on the specifics, kind of take this official story as the starting point for their analyses. So temporally, the story tends to begin with the mass white, white, mass white settlement in the Southern Plains region and the introduction of the plow that broke the plains. Some accounts end with devastation and others depict triumph of the pioneer over the land. Others still emphasize the Dust Bowl refugee problem, which Woody Guthrie was just singing about when you came in, um, or the displacement of farmers resulting from crop failures, market collapse, and bank foreclosures. What many of these scholarly and official accounts have in common is their focus on the plight of the land and poor whites as a fate unique to this region. So this mirrors the emphases of famous cultural depictions of the Dust Bowl in the cinematography of Pere Lorenz, in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, in the music you just heard of Woody Guthrie, and in the photography of Dorothea Lange. So accordingly, enduring popular and scholarly images of that period include the billowing dust storms, desert scapes dotted with ruins of once verdant cotton fields, and poor white folks in places like Oklahoma or Texas, sometimes on their way out west. So all of these images are poignant and important reminders of the class dynamics and ecological rapaciousness of what environmental historian Donald Worcester called the ruling capitalist ethos. This ethos, he writes, brought Henry Fordism to the plains in the form of industrial agriculture and an all out dedication to cash. However, these images of the Dust Bowl and the way it's almost universally depicted in mainstream environmental discourse, including in the academic and scientific literature, 
against the backdrop of frontier history also illustrates the very problematic persistence of American exceptionalism in US environmental thought. So memories of the Dust Bowl, like other memories of westward expansion and like memories of the trek in South Africa are whitened with the effect that the links between settler colonialism and ecological degradation are largely ignored. And so with this, you have a crisis in the United States that's conspicuously extracted from the broader historical context of the rapid expansion of colonialism and imperialism in the decades leading up to this period. However, I've argued in my work that it's this context that's necessary to understand the timing of the Dust Bowl, its severity, and the fact that the disaster on the US Southern Plains was in reality just one regional, if spectacular manifestation of what was in fact an international crisis of soil degradation by the 1930s. The problems of interpretation of the Dust Bowl are also compounded by contemporary accounts that suggest the crisis was unforeseen and therefore unpreventable. But once it was recognized, human, human persever perseverance and ingenuity, perhaps in the form of the New Deal um, conservation programs, resolved it. So in the United States, school textbooks, policymakers, and scientists continue to repeat this very erroneous view. I think President Obama, in his Yes, We Can speech, even um, alludes to the Dust Bowl in that way. So today, stories about the Dust Bowl and the New Deal are used to suggest that through science, technology, and improved agricultural policy, perhaps embodied in a Green New Deal, we can solve contemporary crises without broader social changes. So in my work, I tell a very different story about this past, and I want to share a part of that with you now. Um, the main goal of my project was to offer a new theoretical and empirical inter interpretation of the Dust Bowl that would overcome some of the limitations of existing accounts and ask what are the different lessons we might learn by um, looking at the Dust Bowl in a new way. So we're going to travel back now to the era of the new imperialism and the integration of the first global agricultural market between the 1870s and, 19 and 1930s. So in 1904, German sociologist Max Weber was in the United States to tour and give lectures. And while visiting, he turned down an invitation from President Theodore Roosevelt in order to visit the US Southern Plains, not long after the government had opened the region more fully by force for white settlement. So this is the region that would become known as the Dust Bowl just a few decades later. It also happens to be where I grew up. Um, I was raised in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, which is the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, capital. So based on Weber's observations of what was then still nominally Indian territory, he wrote that with almost lightning speed, everything that stands in the way of capitalistic culture is being crushed. He was referring both to the rapid devastation of the regional environment and to the violent dispossession of indigenous nations, especially through the federal policies of war expropriation, privatization, and allotment of communal land. So Weber made these observations at a time when much of the world, in addition to the Southern Plains, was subject to lightning speed transformation brought about by capitalist development via the new imperialism. At the heart of this transformation, as W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, was the vast quest for the dark world's wealth and toil. Du Bois said, with the dog in the manger theory of trade, with the determination to reap inordinate profits and to exploit the weakest to the utmost, there came a new imperialism. A distinguishing feature of this period, which took off in the wake of the US Civil War and abolition of slavery in this country, was the incredible increase in the rate of territorial acquisition by Europe, the United States, and Britain to three times the rate of the previous colonial period. So Japan also um, extended its imperial reach in this era. As economist Harry Magdoff explains by 1914, as a consequence of this new expansion and conquest, on top of that of preceding centuries, the colonial powers, their colonies, and their former colonies extended over approximately 85% of the Earth's surface. Historian Roxanne dunbar has written that the essential ideology of colonial projects, white supremacy, was part of the culture of conquest energizing Anglo-European and US expansion. And Du Bois described this as the new religion of whiteness, which proclaimed whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever 
Amen. U.S. imperialism, including wars against the Plains tribes and colonial expansion west of the Mississippi, was encouraged and lauded internationally by the colonial powers as contributing to white control of the world's peoples and resources. And despite fierce anti-colonial resistance, by the turn of the century, the United States had seized Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, the Marshall Islands, Cuba, and the Northern Mariana Islands, and waged a war of atrocity against the newly declared Philippine Republic. This racially justified expropriation of lands and peoples enriched and increased the capacity of what we now call global North nations and their economic elites who financed, carried out, and benefited from this expropriation to reinforce their rule. As sociologist David Nugui Pello writes, natural resources are used and abused to support racial hegemony and domination and have been at the core of this process throughout the history of capitalist development. So these were some of the preconditions for the reorganization of global agriculture and labor that constituted what environmental historian and my colleague at Amherst College, Ted Melillo, refers to as the first green revolution. It's through these processes that the first global food regime came into existence. And sociologists describe the first global food regime, which we date from 1870 to 1930, as combining tropical imports to Europe with basic grains and livestock imports from settler colonies. So these imports really provisioned the emerging European industrial classes and underwrote the Anglo-American workshop of the world at this time. Um, Complementing plantation agricultures imposed in colonies of occupation, which compromised their food systems and ecological resources, 19th century Europe and Britain outsourced their staple food production to colonies of settlement, overexploiting soil frontiers in the so-called New World. So here, the establishment of national agricultural sectors within the emerging settler states like the United States, Canada, and Australia modeled 20, 20th century development as an articulated dynamic between national agricultural and industrial sectors. So this cash crop agriculture that expanded so rapidly at this time is very different in its social and ecological consequences from subsistence agriculture or even farming by locals to supply local markets. It's very volatile. It's subject to global market fluctuations and absentee ownership. And there's an insatiable quality to it. As long as there's money to make or because of the role of finance in agriculture and taxes, there are debts to pay. As a consequence, fields are planted when they should rest. Forests are cleared to expand production despite the ecological effects. Herds are expanded when they should be reduced and so on, leading to rapid degradation of the land. It's from this context that a global problem of soil erosion emerged by the turn of the 20th century, associated with the vigorous seizure of native lands and displacement of peoples, the imposition of racist land tenure policies, the sp spread of cash crops, and the continuation of plantation-style agriculture. So putting events on the U.S. Southern Plains in this context helps explain both the timing of the Dust Bowl and the rapidity of soil erosion on a global scale by the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. So now that you have this bigger picture, I wanna explain some of the key um, antecedents in the US Southern Plains region that reflect these global trends that led directly to the Dust Bowl. So back on the US Southern Plains, land held in common by indigenous nations was seen as a particular barrier to continue expansion of US territory. So in the late 1800s, under the leadership of people like Massachusetts Senator Henry Dawes, the federal government violently imposed the division and privatization of much of the remaining tribal lands that were still held in common in the late 1800s. So one of the main policies towards this end was the General Allotment or Dawes Severalty Act of 1887. The US government faced a fierce resistance to this land theft and in the Dust Bowl region, a legal challenge led by Kiowa Chief Lone Wolf that went all the way to the Supreme Court. But the court reinforced US colonial policy, ruling that Congress had jurisdiction over the tribes for whom there was no recognized legal recourse. So on the 4th of July in 1901, while the United States celebrated the 125th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, 
President McKinley appointed William Howard Taft as the colonial governor general of the Philippines. And on the same day, he proclaimed the remaining lands of the Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, and Wichita in what would become the Dust Bowl region open for settlement. The so-called unassigned lands on the Southern Plains left after allotment were open for white settlement. And just after the Dawes Act was passed, South Africa passed the Glen Gray Act and New Zealand took a similar approach as did other settler colonies. So during this period, Anglo-European and US imperial regimes really learned from each other and shared expertise and developed a kind of trans-imperial approach to the administrative challenges associated with what was from their perspective, taking up the white man's burden on a global scale. As a result, their policies of land theft, including the privatization and expropriation of indigenous lands held in common, looked very similar, whether it was employed in French Algeria under Napoleon III, or the Cape Colony under Cecil Rhodes, or an in Indian territory in what would become the state of Oklahoma. And on the US Southern Plains, these settlers reliant upon government support, including military backing, land subsidies, agricultural assistance, and the development of infrastructure, including water supplies, became the greedy bankers, landowners, and poor whites that are later portrayed in the scholarly and popular literature about the Dust Bowl. Arriving on the U.S. Southern Plains, settlers became caught up in relations of unequal exchange with the wealthier industrial and financial centers and as the first systemic federal report on the Dust Bowl said, which was published in 1936, they were caught up in a system of agriculture which could not be both permanent and prosperous. The plains became integrated into the global economy as a cash crop producing region, a condition made possible and encouraged by the US government and private capital. And the consequences of all of this were catastrophic as we know. So while scholars rightly emphasize the ruling capitalist ethos driving change in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this can't in any way be disentangled from the white supremacist logic that was driving and legitimizing domination of the domination of peoples, as well as the expropriation and exploitation of the land. The combined result was an unprecedented expansion of glo the global economy, white territorial control, social dislocation, and ecological degradation. So the extraordinary level of ecological and social devastation associated with colonial expansion around the world resulted in what David Anderson has called the first global environmental problem, or the first environmental problem that was recognized or seen at the time as global. So he was referring to the massive soil erosion crisis caused by colonial land use change. This devastation and the broader ecological and social crises of colonialism gave, wise, gave rise to widespread environmental concern among, amongst elites at this time and contributed to the development of what we might now call environmental science and policy, including a sophisticated transnational soil science. As a result of this, for decades preceding the Dust Bowl, Anglo-European and U US frontier and colonial officials had ample warning about the growing problem of soil erosion. There were sufficient stores of knowledge and technical know-how to address the crisis and known historical examples of society's erosion prevention efforts, which go back a millennia. Furthermore, for decades, a cadre of elites from US presidents to captains of industry were part of an international cohort of colonial scientists businessmen and officials who were committed conservationists, aware of the need for soil conservation on a massive scale. And there were major conferences convening scientists and policymakers. There was even one where every governor of the United States um, participated to address the growing ecological crises of the era, including soil erosion. So because of all this, back in the 1930s, accounts of the Dust Bowl by the world's premier soil scientists like this one from which my book got its title, situated the crisis in global historical terms as an outcome of imperial expansion, the spread of cash crop agriculture, and the drive for white territorial control that prioritized securing land from the so-called natives at all costs um, over more humane and ecological priorities. So unlike contemporary authors and commentators writing about the Dust Bowl, they had a global frame of reference and repeatedly publications in the 1930s lament the decades of ignored 
warnings that led to the global crisis. In surveying the consequences of this history, famous British soil scientists Graham Jacks and Robert White, White wrote in their book um, called The Rape of the Earth that the white man's burden in the future will be to come to terms with the soil and plant world. And for many reasons, it promises to be a heavier burden than coming to terms with the native. So there's a significant literature to this effect um, published leading up to and during the 1930s. I write about this in my book. It's very raw, acknowledges the destruction of the land, of communities, of regional economies to make way for colonial cap capitalist agriculture, and so on. However, this understanding of the Dust Bowl has been completely lost in contemporary narratives, so that the problem, as Michaelina alluded to earlier, seems one of just using the appropriate agricultural techniques, like climate smart agriculture is one of the big buzzwords now, rather than addressing systemic social issues. So this has had serious consequences for the lessons contemporary writers draw from the history of crises like the Dust Bowl. And there's a lot more that we could talk about um, from this period, but just to begin to wrap up so we can have time for discussion, I want to reiterate that I think it's urgent that we re-embed our narratives of ecological crises like the Dust Bowl within their broader historical geographical and political economic contexts. So doing so allows for the kinds of insight that I think are critical necess critically necessary in this new Dust Bowl era of climate change, in which we see increasing agricultural and climate refugees, refugee crises, and as a result, massive human suffering well beyond the scale of dislocation caused by the 1930s Dust Bowl. So, what can we learn by looking at the Dust Bowl in a new way? I think there's a lot, but there's a few things I just want to summarize here at the end. One of the first lessons for me is that the historical record makes absolutely clear that ecological crises under capitalism are not resolved by increased scientific understanding, commonly held knowledge, sophisticated technological development, advanced warnings, or a slew of pro-conservation elites who are attempting to tackle our problems. So this is a central lesson I think that has to guide our understanding and organizing if we're going to effectively address these multifaceted crises that we have today. Similar to the ineffective climate conferences held for decades by the United Nations, world leaders and mainstream environmentalism could not ultimately prevent or resolve the crisis of soil erosion in the 1930s because of their commitment to maintaining the global social and economic status quo, the racialized class system that we still live in today. So the global dust bowl did not arise because there was a lack of awareness of the issue or the technological means to the technical means to address it. Like dust bowlification and climate change today, the ultimate source of the crisis was social, not technological, thus requiring transformative change to address. So the British colonial soil scientists I just mentioned, Jackson White, like others from their era, recognized in the 1930s that the commitment to the social and economic, economic status quo would make it impossible to truly address the crisis of soil erosion. So they wrote, so long as the land yielded fat profits, the restrictive measures which were already recognized as necessary if the soil were to be saved had no chance of being applied. And they continued, in another um, part of their work to say where land utilization practices are firmly established and have become the basis of the country's economy, the adoption of a new land utilization program conforming to the limits imposed by the natural environment may well involve a social and political revolution. Therein lies the supreme difficulty of applying effective erosion control. We now know fairly precisely what agricultural, pastoral, forest, and engineering principles must be adopted to stop the earth from rotting away beneath our feet, but we cannot or dare not apply them forthwith on a scale commensurate with the gravity of the situation. And despite 100 years since this period of technological and scientific advancement in agriculture, these eco social and economic commitments have led us to where we find ourselves today with farmland around the world degraded on an, on an unprecedented scale, which is exactly where these soil scientists um, 100 years ago warned us that we would wind up. 
So not only can we not count on elites to prevent a crisis of catastrophic proportions, we already see that in this new Dust Bowl era, economic and political elites are not prepared to ensure even the basic safety and security of those on the front lines of the climate crisis in this country, much less internationally, despite all the lessons we supposedly learned from hu human tragedies like the Dust Bowl and the New Deal response. So we've seen this over and over again in the United States with hurricanes like Katrina and Maria with fires and floods. And despite all the attention the Dust Bowl receives, we still see farm workers bearing the brunt of ecological catastrophe today. And in fact, farmers remain cursed by the racist New Deal era laws and meager social safety net that as a result of anti-Black racism excluded farm workers from protections that are becoming even more important under climate change. So today, farmers, including children, which legally work in the fields right here in North Carolina, are being worked to death with rising heat. So some of you might know that in a, C a recent CDC report on heat-related deaths, North Carolina reported more farm worker fatalities due um, to heat than any other state in the United States. And over a 25-year period, 45% of all heat-related fatalities in North Carolina occurred amongst farm workers, many of whom the report said died unnoticed and without medical attention. So in the absence of federal labor protections that address heat-related morbidity and mortality, people are trying to do something at the state level. But farm workers don't only um, not have protections from the increasingly dangerous weather associated with climate change, they're also not protected by minimum wage or overtime laws, and they're not protected from unemployment when drought or floods ruin crops. So Governor Newsom, there was an initiative in, in California recently, which Governor, Governor Newsom vetoed, um, that would have provided some minimum support for unemployed farm workers who, who face extreme vulnerability as a result of climate-induced crop losses. So who can live like this? We don't ask the landowners to live like this, but the problems here are being borne on the backs of these very vulnerable populations who are feeding us. So one of the last points that I want to leave you with is that the Dust Bowl era and the way it's almost universally understood illustrates that in the mainstream environmental discourse, including the academic literature, there's an insufficient conceptualization of the historical and contemporary links between ecological degradation and social domination. This has led to a shallow conception of environmental justice that's had an impact on environmental politics in this country and around the world. So many focus on environmental justice as just the unjust distribution of outcomes of environmental harm. Colonized peoples are homogenized and described as stakeholders in environmental conflicts. Mainstream environmental organizations, which are on the privileged side of the segregated environmental movement globally are encouraged to diversify their staff and memberships and pay attention to issues of justice. However, the deeper aspects of social domination required to maintain the economic, social, and environmental status quo are often denied, minimized, or simply ignored. So broader recognition of what sociologist Evelyn Nakano Glenn calls the ongoing structure of settler colonialism and imperialism would be a great advance in the broader environmental movement, in the environmental social sciences, and also in Dust Bowl historiography. It would keep alive the recognition of the original and ongoing injustices done and their continuing effects. So to sum it all up, at the heart of the matter from my perspective is that allowing the accumulation of injustice makes inevitable what my colleague John Bellamy Foster has called the accumulation of catastrophe. And one of the main takeaways that I want to leave you with is that when we talk about ecological crises like climate change, biodiversity loss, water pollution and, scar and scarcity and soil degradation, at the root we're talking about social problems. And when scientists today predict the increasing possibility of Dust Bowl-like conditions under climate change, they're signaling a particular kind of extreme ecological and social change. The projected changes have extreme consequences, but also extreme are the social forces, historical developments, policies, and practices that produce such massive socio-ecological crises. So many environmentalists and policymakers, especially in wealthier countries, tend to ignore this reality and focus on addressing only the symptoms of this colonial history 
which is reflected today in global inequalities and wealth and power, the continued exploitation of lands and resources around the world um, against the wishes of local communities affected, and in the segregation of the global population, which is reproduced in the environmental movement globally. Superficial approaches to addressing race, colonialism, and capitalist development have allowed environmentalists, policymakers, and scholars too often, as Roxanne dunbar has written, to safely put aside present responsibility for continued harm done by the past and questions of reparations, restitution, and reordering society. So all of this precludes the possibility of a deeper solidarity across historical divisions and hinders the effectiveness of the environmental movement in making lasting change that's both ecologically and socially restorative and just. And this is critical as the future of environmentalism, whether it can play a part in creating a genuinely green and just world, will hinge on whether such solidarity is fought for and won, and whether we can move past ahistorical conceptions of ecological disaster that conceal the reality that massive ecological change is, out, is, is impossible without massive social change. So I've argued in my work that to build the deeper ecological solidarity we need to address the crises that we're facing today, it's necessary to break out of this cycle of historical violence, achieve genuine justice, and heal the ecological rift of capitalism. And then to, to do this, I've argued that we need to replace or add to the three R's of mainstream environmentalism, which you might have seen there on stickers like all around my campus, the reduce, reuse, the cycle, uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, what I propose is the more urgent for the restitution of lands and sovereignty and power to people, reparations for slavery, stolen land, st stolen land and labor, genocide, and other past injustices, restoration of earth systems and revolution, moving away from capitalism. Like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said at once, um, at one point, I hope all of us might gather the courage given what we're confronting to be unapologet unapologetically radical, which simply means in the Latin to get to the root of things. Okay, if we have any questions, also on, on Zoom, I can read those out if anyone has any questions in the room. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much for this very layered and carefully organized presentation. Um, I want to ask a question, zooming a bit out, just because what you're presenting just raises so many questions for me. I, I, it's like an open question about this point on like how the, the ecological crisis is also social, it's tied to uh, social, um, it's socially caused, no? I'm just, so I'm thinking about two things and feel free to say whatever comes to your mind. One is how, how can you think of also the ways that ecological crisis is shaping Imaginaries of the political right now mm -hmm. in terms of like rising fascism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that I know it's a broad question. The other one is um, if us in the university, no, what is our pedagogical role or where? That's not a question of like the answer. No, like how do you see the pedagogical practice as also a way to work towards? Uh, this R's or that you mentioned, or to maybe a sense of reenchantment of possibilities of making that we also need for today mm -hmm. to avoid rising fascism. No. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, this is very broad, but I, I'm just, I would love to hear what you would have to say based on all this rich work you're doing, which is this question. <laughs> Great, thank you for that question. Yeah. So the first, so the first question, if I understood and correct me if I'm wrong, was about how ecological crises also inform cultural, political, social developments, such as the kind of rise in what we're calling eco-fascism. That was the first question, right? So I think that, um, yeah, that's a huge. I, I think it was the activist um, 
think I'm a scholar, but not in the traditional sense. Naomi Klein, they gave a speech at one point where she said, you know, we're all um, concerned about the fact that these people are not taking action on climate change, but she's like, we also need to be concerned about what happens when they do begin to take it seriously. And I think that we're already starting to see this kind of, and you know, fortress world development and a lot of reaction to what are really, and in fact, climate migrants um, being the rise of this kind of hostility and in, in what are truly eco-fascist lifeboat ethic um, kind of politics and narratives. And so you're right, I think that there has to be, which gets to the, your question about education. And the second question, if I understood it um, correctly, was what are the role of university? What's the pedago our pedagogical responsibility and in what input or um, impact can we have and perhaps contributing to things going a different direction than in an eco-fascist direction? So I think that's, a, that's exactly the question I'm asking myself every day um, because that feels so urgent. It's not, it's not, fun to teach about these issues and then not be talking about what we're going to do about it. It just starts to feel like, we, what are we going to do? Like, what are we all sitting here doing, talking about this? We should be out doing something else. Like, this is serious stuff. But I, I do think um, the most recent IPCC report that came out, I don't know if you all were familiar as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For the first time um, in April, the report included a lot more um, on the social science of climate mitigation. A lot of co my colleagues in environmental sociology participated in that panel. And so for the first time, it looks at like issues like colonial, it, deal it deals with a lot of stuff in more um, detail than previous reports have done. And one of the things that came out in that report was the, and we were just talking about this earlier, Michael, was the need for new narratives about climate change, like the narratives that are empowering that also, you know, paint different climate futures, right? And I think that that's, um, when we're teaching, we're obviously teaching based on evidence and so on, but we're always telling stories in the way that we select the information that we're going to prioritize and so on. We're always telling a story. And I think finding, you know, thinking about the way we do that in the classroom is important, but also I've been more and more, um, and this is related to the what I've done at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, why, um, which Michaeline mentioned, like I've been more and more like taking every opportunity to be involved in more public education. And so like the work at the museum was about how they're trying to take a 17th century Dutch exhibit and turn it into a kind of educational space around the connections between past and present colonialism and ecological and social effects. And I've been um, working with K through 12 teachers, like even in New York, did a workshop who are trying to bring in the social side of the story into their environment, like in their environment courses. And I've been trying to work with people who are trying to do that at that level, especially in a context where there's so much hostility to teaching any environmental science um, in public schools. But I think finding more opportunities, I also try to say yes every single time and, and a community group asks, can you come talk to us about you know, anything, I just say yes every time and also think about how our skills as scholars give us skills we can share and contribute. And so I've edited publications for activists, so, you know, like done things that we do all the time. I think trying to make connections with what's going on around you um, and thinking about how your position allows you to, one, both play a role in educating people, bringing people to campus to talk about these issues who are really engage. Um, we were also talking about that earlier, um, but also thinking about you have a skill set as scholars and how can we contribute those. And also, I think doing more things like this, connecting more with people who care about the same issues is crucially important because I think at some point we also need a more organized response on the part of academia to what's happening a more, yeah, a much more organized response than we have right now. I don't know if that answer is a, if, okay. I have a question from the Zoom audience. Uh, Trivius Caldwell writes, thank you for this perspective that brings environmentalism and injustice to the forefront. What is, in your opinion, what is your opinion on land use practices that aim to keep up with technological advancements but result in displacement of people who cannot handle the increase in housing expenses? Could you say that one more time? Sure. 
What is your opinion on land use practices that aim to keep up with technical technological um, advancements, but result in displacement of people who cannot handle the increase in housing expenses? So it sounds like this is a question about green gentrification. Often when you have um, environmental develop amenities um, that are introduced in, for example, urban areas, it makes the property values go up and rents go up and because these areas become more attractive. And so you have um, people who are pushed out and don't benefit from the things that are often proposed in their name um, in these places. And so that's something that I think that there wasn't as much attention to 10 years ago, but now like we're having this huge discussion in Massachusetts right now about the expansion of public transportation and what that will do. And, and the way that they're trying to deal with it there is to ensure that there's um, affordable housing all around these um, transportation hubs. And you're starting to see this huge resistance to having more affordable housing to trying to deal with that. But it's a huge issue. And it's not just in cities, but obviously you all probably in this workshop dealt with the history of conservation. There's a long history of dispossession and dislocation of people to, you know, to address um, environmental, you know, supposedly address environmental problems. And that's just, re that's colonialism. And I think that that's something that we have to, everything that we're thinking about always, we have to center the question of like, you know, in whose name, who benefits and how are we, I, I mean, I think this is the whole climate justice framework, right? Like how are we both meeting people's needs and reducing inequalities of wealth and power at the same time that we mitigate greenhouse gas emissions? That was a good question. Um, this is a little bit, a little bit, um, but I, I love the, the way you refer to R's when you do the cycle into the four R's, but just looking at how you describe the R's and the kind of situation, for example, with our education system, especially Florida in the case, um, how can we move towards these R's? If we, if the United, in the case of the United States, they won't even acknowledge the colonial or empire past and not even the present. Uh, from my experience, I have professors who publicly told me that um, the colonies of the United States were not colonies because they could decide to become a state or not become a state. And I've tried to explain to these professors, like, no, it's not that simple, but it's not that simple um, to educate in, in that sense, especially if they're like older than you or have more a degree than you. And how do we change that perspective? How do we get people to understand the colonial power that the United States has yeah. and how that intervenes then with the environment and these arts? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, given that I come from Oklahoma, I don't know how much you all follow the news, but Oklahoma seems to be at the forefront of every regressive policy movement in the in the country right now. I mean, it has one of the so you have the, for example, um, several tribal governments that have come out against a law that was passed there just in the past. It had to have been a year or two years ago that basically transformed the history curriculum. And they're saying, like, how can we like there's almost 40 tribal nations in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma. And they're saying, like, you, how can you pretend like basically we don't, our history doesn't exist here, or the Tulsa um, race riot, one of the worst massacres, race riots in, in U.S. history. And so I think one of the things that the right has done really effectively is to mobilize people at the local level to do things like, you know, all these get involved in school boards to focus on education and so on, so much. And I think that we, again, kind of going back to needing a more organized response on the part of educators, I think there has to be a massive struggle over education. And I mean, there is one, right? It's happening. But I think that more of us need to be more proactive in that and also calling out that this isn't about, I mean, they're, they're conflating public education with government indoctrination. <laughs> this is the, and people don't know, you know, what, Talk, you know what they're talking about, but they're inflaming all of these concerns that parents have about parental rights and so on. But I think we have to, like, um, I think it was Ibram Kendi said in one of his books, like they're attacking social and natural science. Like they're not just attacking the climate science, and this is social science. 
the critical race theory is, is social science, like, and, and talk about the evidence and push back on politicians being able to um, determine what gets taught and to whom, where, and what time and so on. So I do think that that's, it, education is a huge thing. That's why the right's focused on it. They know like a younger, I mean, this is some sociology. So it's like, they see there's a real generational divide on perspectives around race and um, perspectives around, you know, gay marriage perspectives around environmental issues. And they're really concerned. The young people don't, aren't the same as, as they don't have the same views. They're changing and they want a more equal, a more just and more environmental, uh, you know, environmentally sane society that comes up over and over again in polls. And I think that's why one reason anyway, there's such a huge attack on education aside from the people that in like in Oklahoma, it's being funded by this movement for school vouchers is being funded by the Koch brother, you know, the Koch brothers, because it's, they've never wanted public educate, you know, there's a whole, yeah, they want private education to be privatized and so on. So there's that part of it as well. That's a money, it's another money-making opportunity. Um, but I do think that I, I, people, we've got to be much more involved in that. So it's a, it's a really great question because you are going to see like, I, I have my nephew, lots of people I love in Oklahoma and it was really shocking um, during like when COVID broke out to just see people I grew up with like struggling I mean, just to see the level of disinformation. And because we don't, Oklahoma is one of the worst education systems in the country, like seeing people not having the opportunity to make sense of that and the kinds of like ideas it was leading people, you know, that was leading people towards, it's just awful. So for all kinds of reasons, we need to focus on education a lot. Hi, um, I guess I kind of have like a, I'm trying to frame this question maybe on like on a more like a uh, method focus level, but the first starter question in this series of questions is, um, do you think like deconstructing subtle colonialism within um, this notion of our relationship with the environment is purely like epistemological, like simply like um, having these discussions or does it necessitate a cross-disciplinary methodological approach? Like what is the role of technology and the sciences within um, this negotiation, I guess? And along the lines of what is the role of like technologies and sciences, um, I guess, like, does it require, like, some degree of, like, negotiation, particularly with those that may be, like, you know, they're passionate about climate change and they're trying to learn about, like, decolonization, but, like, they just might not get it. Like, not might not get it, but just, like, the, the degrees and years of training that they have done has now, like, put them in a position where they have to do several more years of training to, like, understand maybe at the position where you're at or something like that. And if that's the case, like... <laughs> To what degree, like, you know, is it okay for a problematic scientist to participate in this creation of technology if it works along with these mm -hmm. sorts of ways? And if not, if you if you don't think that there is any role of technology because they're already fucked up, like, <laughs> do you think that it's, like, <laughs> practical given the time limit, like, right, what they say is, like, 2050, it could even be earlier, mm -hmm. that um, to just to just maybe go through this decolonial, subtle, deconstructing these ways of conversation, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense okay. because I'm, I was an, I'm a sociologist, but um, I've moved half of my FT now as an environmental studies, which is dominated heavily by biology, people in the natural and physical sciences at my school so far. We've just hired some more people, so it's changing. But the, your question's one that I think about a lot because we're coming from such different perspectives and all, you know, trying to get along and all concerned about the crises, but we're, yeah, there's been um, a lot of interesting conversations when we start talking about how we're focusing on what kinds of solutions to the crises and so on. And um, also just about our epistemological approach to teaching about nature, like whose views and who are the writers and, you know, all of this is coming up. And so I do think about it a lot. And I would say that one of the things you said about the need for more interdisciplinary conversation, I think that that's true. And I've seen that also happening a little more now. Like I've been invited to some workshops where there are, I mean, it's not just the social sciences 
and then physical and natural sciences, it's also the different social sciences, like economics, really different from sociology. Um, so I was just at a workshop with a lot of economists. And they're like, history, you know, <laughs> like, what is all, like, God, <laughs> we've got our models here and we just need to know what the, what, what's the social cost of carbon. Um, anyway, so I do think that there's a more interdisciplinary, but also I think that something that I've been hopeful about is that with the Black Lives Matter uprising, with um, Standing Rock opposition, like there has been a kind of reckoning within some of the big environmental organizations that I've been, I was, I've been tracking that a little bit and writing and just seeing that people, they're being put on the spot by other movements are talking to each other and saying like, you know, you want to get on board with this, like you're all here to help us protest the pipeline, you know, but look at what your policy, you know, the policies you're promoting. So I think there's a kind of questioning that's happening right now that's informing what, what I see at my school, which is students who are active pushing back on faculty and on our department saying like the students voted on their own without us and said, we want to be an anti-colonial, um, anti-racist environmental studies department. And we, they showed up at a meeting and said, will everybody vote for this? The faculty, they were like, <laughs> and they did. And so then we had a basis for talking about, so what does that mean for our curriculum? The kinds of courses and again the kinds of solutions that we are so i do feel like there's this shift happening and more and more i think um there's just even natural and physical scientists to people thinking about technology that are being put on the spot to make those connections and i don't think it takes i this is i told some of my colleagues it doesn't take years more of training like there's a few you can read a few things but also just look at what's going on who's being impacted bring who are you bringing what voices are you bringing to the table it's like it's, yeah, I think the assumption that, yeah, we have to learn a whole new field to get it. It's like, if you listen to people and see what's going on, I think that people could go a long ways, but that's a good question. Does that response make sense? <laughs> that was just like, like, I think like the, the reason I have this question is I think given my own background there's like this tension right like do we build technologies like I do see. we build new technologies or do we instead shift our approach to reconstructing the system does that make sense so like, yeah I meant like that oh i see negotiation as well like do we put more people in like you know there's so much scientific research to like undo climate change yes. so like do we work on that temporarily because of maybe like i see i don't know if it's problematic to say the practicality but let's say say like to us like if it's like two years right the practicality of like reorganizing an entire system to be like yeah. on the grass. So, yeah. You're yeah. saying that the technological has a better shot. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's what I think I was asking. The question oh, yeah. The question. Well, I so I think that those two things are intimately related. Like the idea of appropriate technology is intimately connected to questions of power, like what technologies get adopted and whose resources are used to build those technologies is I think that those can't be not like we do one first and then see what we do about the other it's like they're part of the same struggle going on right now obviously it's like you have the united states china interested in all of these countries right now that have like lithium you know and so you've got you're just starting to see the same processes develop again with the new um, green energy transition and so i think that we're having to have those conversations in tandem and in fact like i haven't been at least in the past like two years, I haven't been to any talks where even like natural and physical scientists, people focused on technology didn't raise that it because movements have been really pushing back on this idea that we're going to have a green transition on the backs of indigenous peoples and communities who are going to be not benefit from the mining, but be affected by it in a permanent way. I don't think that that conversation is loud enough at all, because there are like, if you, I, I should have brought the figures with me because I'm not good at remembering all the numbers all the time. Um, but I, I just saw like, if you, if we did have, if a hundred percent of energy in the United States came from so-called green sources, I forget the amount of like ma minerals and materials that would require, we just had profound global effects. So we have to be talking about the structure of society at the same time we're talking about what is appropriate technology because at the scale of energy use, which in the United States is way higher than 
even most European countries, but Europe's is also still very high. Like we just can't sustain, the world can't sustain the scale of um, energy use that especially the affluent um, enjoy in this country. And so I think that I like the way you're thinking about them, but I think we can't separate those out. And so we do need technological change. We need to not be burning fossil fuels. That's important for the whole world. Um, but we also need to talk about how what that looks like. Okay, um, I see we have a couple more questions here, but uh, we need to wrap up. So I'm gonna make, I'll find a way to share those with you. But I wanna thank you, Professor Holman, for the, yeah. the wonderful talk and presentation for being thank with you. us.